Tito. Sweeping down upon the underworld to smash gangland comes the mysterious, all-powerful character who is a problem to the police, but a crusader for law. In reality, Dan Garrett, a rookie patrolman, loved by everyone, but suspected by none of being the Blue Beetle. As the Blue Beetle, he hides behind a strange mask and a suit of impenetrable blue chain armor, flexible as silk, but stronger than steel. Today's episode of The Blue Beetle is entitled The Frame-Up. Stanley Rogers, convicted of killing Bat Doylton, small-time loan shark and gambler, is in the death house at the state penitentiary awaiting death by electrocution. Rogers, scion of a prominent and respectable family, claims he shot in self-defense. But the jury thought otherwise. As our story opens, patrolman Dan Garrett who in secret is really the Blue Beetle, is entering the little apothecary shop of Dr. Franz, his confidant and friend. Hello, Doc. Where are you? I am back here. Is that you, Danny? Yes. What are you doing? Okay, I'm, I'm working on some experiments in my laboratory. Uh, how are you this morning? Oh, I'm feeling great. I've been waiting for you to show up. Anything special? Uh, here's something in the personal column of this morning's paper that might interest you. Hmm. To the Blue Beetle. I am desperate. My brother awaits death by electrocution for a crime he did not commit. Can you help me? Brenda Rogers. Well, that must be uh, Stanley Rogers who shot Beth Doylson, a small-time racketeer. Yes. Uh, rather a strange case, if I remember correctly. Rogers admitted he shot Doylson, but claimed it was in self-defense. He shot him with a pistol he found in Doylson's apartment, I believe. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it brought out in the trial that Rogers owed Doylson a large sum of money? Yes, he borrowed from him on several occasions to cover his gambling losses. Where did Rogers meet Doylson? He was introduced to Rogers by a girl, chance acquaintance at a gambling club. Oh, it's too bad. Rogers comes of a good family. I can't understand his getting mixed up in such a thing. Well, he was a little wild at college. Too much money to spend. Often at an early age, wasn't he? Yeah. He was really raised by an older sister who spoiled him. Well, he's certainly in a spot now. Yes, he is. Uh, what are you going to do about that notice in the newspaper? Well, I'm going to pay a visit to young Rogers in the death house. Never talk with him. As Dan Garrett or as the Blue Beetle? As the Blue Beetle. But how are you going... I'd like to use some of your invisible paint, Doc, so that I can get to Rogers without anyone knowing it. It'll be dangerous if you're caught. I, uh, I haven't been able to perfect the liquid yet. Well, it'll serve my purpose. I won't be with Rogers very long. Well, be careful, Danny boy. Be careful. I will. Don't worry, Doc. Well, i got to get down to headquarters now. If I can, I'll be back later to change into my Blue Beetle chain armor and mask. I'll be here to help you at any time you want me, Danny. Thanks, Doc. So long. I'm going to read up a little on the Rogers case. Get your feet off that table and stand at attention when your superior officer enters the room. Uh, oh, he hello, Danny. It's you. I, I was just getting a little shut eye. The night's the time for sleeping. Uh, yeah, I know, but I've been on extra duty lately. And, and you uh, have to catch up when you sleep at headquarters. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and besides, I was waiting for you. I, uh, I want to ask you a few questions, Mike. Well, fire away, me boy. If it's about crime and criminals, Officer Mike Manigan is a regular encycl... Uh, encyclopedia. <laughs> encyclopedia? Uh, yeah, that's it. What do you know about Bat Doylson? Oh, him. Huh. He was a small-time loan shark before the Rogers boy bumped him off. Do you think Rogers' killing of Doylson was premeditated? No, I don't. Oh, neither do I. This Doylson guy was a bad egg. Where could I find out more about him? Well, maybe Charlie Storm of the Sun could help you out. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll give him a ring. Uh, say, Dan, why are you so interested in this Rogers case? Huh? Oh, I, I, I'm interested in the loan shark racket, and I want to find out all I can about those connected with it. Hello, son. Give me Charlie Storm, please. Well, maybe the commissioner would assign his boat to it if we asked him. Uh, later, perhaps, Mike. The present, I. Oh, hello, Charlie. 
This is Dan, Dan Garrett. Say, hey, uh, what do you know about Bat Doylton? Yeah? Yeah, Maroney? Top man, huh? Really? That high? Say, hey, that's very interesting, Charlie. I think I'll get busy and really dig into this lone shark business. <laughs> you find out at police headquarters? I uh, phoned Charlie Storm with a son. He should be able to give you valuable information. He uh, told me that a man named Moroni was the top man in the loan shark racket. Was Doylson associated with him? No. Doylson's racket was to hang around the gambling halls and racetracks by means of attractive girls in his employ who strike up casual acquaintances with heavy betters, get himself introduced to a loser as a wealthy playboy whom one might touch for a loan. I see. But you say he wasn't working with Maroney. No. In fact, he was planning to set up a rival loan business, working among the poorer class of unfortunate people who really need money. But that's a legitimate business. Uh-huh. Not the way these loan sharks run it. Well, how do you mean? Well, let's say a man borrows $100. Yes. He also has to take out life insurance for the same people to assure the loan being paid back in case he dies. These costs and interest on the loan are pyramided so that in some cases the borrower has paid over five and six times the amount of the original loan. And he still owes the principal. Why, why, that's crooked business. Of course it is. And that's the racket the Blue Beetle is going to smash. Where is the Blue Beetle going to light first? In the cell of Stanley Rogers at the state penitentiary. Have you the liquid of invisibility, Danny? Yeah, right here, Doc. I'm going to use it. Go on, Doc. The Blue Beetle is going to fly right into jail. Meanwhile, in the electrocution chamber at the state penitentiary, some officials are testing the lethal equipment. How about the electrodes, Sam? Clean as a knife blade, Warden. And the straps? All in order, sir. Have you tried the switches? I was just about to do that, sir. All right. Shoot some juice through and check your dial. Yes, sir. In just a moment. I'll give her 1,800 volts and then jump it to 2,000. All right. What's your dial indicate, Sam? 2,000? That should be strong enough for young Rogers. Yes, yeah, too strong, in fact. But the court has ordered his execution, and it is our duty to carry out their order. Want any more? Nope. Shut everything off. That's all for today. I'm going to my office. I'd like to see you there later to check details for the execution in the morning. Yes, sir. Has uh, Father Callahan seen young Rogers today? I think he's with him now, sir. Ask him to see me in my office when he's finished with Rogers. My son, are there any messages you'd like me to give to anyone? Oh, what's the use, Father? Everyone thinks I'm a murderer. Well, what about your sister, Brenda? She still believes in you. What can I say to her that she doesn't already know? Perhaps a little word of farewell? Farewell. Or... Farewell. Yes, I'm going to farewell. I'm going to burn for something I didn't do. There, there, my son. You mustn't let yourself go like that. Try to face things bravely. Secure in the knowledge that there is another life after death. But I'm not ready for death yet, Father. I want my life now. Why can't somebody do something for me? I'm innocent. I'm innocent, I tell you. Everything possible to do has been done, my son. No word from the governor's father. I'm sorry, my son. Perhaps later tonight. Your lawyer has been in touch with his secretary. We are all doing everything we can. Thank you, father. I'm sorry I acted as I did. Please leave me now. I'd like to be... Alone. Very well. Good night, my son. Good night, father. Oh, God, will you come with me, please? I'd like to speak with you a minute. Well, sure thing, father. All right with you. What was that humming? Was that the sound of... That was the sound of the blue beetle's magic ray. The blue beetle? Yes, the blue beetle. But I can't see any. I am invisible. What are you doing here? I've come to help you. Who sent you? 
Your sister. My sister? But how did you... Never mind how she got in touch with me. Now listen to what I have to say. Speak softly so the guard won't hear you. This invisibility of mine may not last long. All right. Now, tell me what happened the night you shot Doyleson. I didn't shoot him. But you admitted in court yes, that... I know I did. And at that time, I thought I had shot him. I... I don't understand. The night of the shooting, I'd gone to Doyleson's apartment to ask him for more time in which to pay my application. Oh, hello, Rogers. Come to pay your notes? Well, I'd like to talk it over with you. Come in. Oh, uh, you know Maroney here? Yes, I met him at the Golden Pheasant Club. Hello, Rogers. Hello, Mr. Maroney. Well, I'll leave you two together. You've got private business to talk about. Oh, look, Maroney, why don't you step into the bedroom there and wait till I finish with Rogers? Won't take long, and you and I can finish our business. Okay, but make it snappy. I ain't got all. Now... What have you got to say, Rogers? Well, I, I can't tell you what I owe you now. If you'll wait till I get the principal of my father's estate next year, I'll pay you double. I can't wait that long. When I lend money, i got to get it back to lend to somebody else. That's how I make a living. But I thought... Don't you... be silly. Now, listen. Every dollar I lend brings me back five or even ten dollars interest. The guys that borrow from me pay me back. Or else. But I can't pay you back now. Well, then tomorrow morning your boss is going to know about this. You can't do that. I'd lose my job at the bank. The disgrace would kill my sister. What Say, you... there's an idea. Your sister's got what it takes. She's a swell-looking gal. I could use her in my business. What do you mean? I could use her at the gambling joint. She could lead the customers on, persuade them to gamble heavily. They lose money, need to borrow... And she introduces him to me. That's what happened to me. Sure, sure. That's the way the old army game works. Why, you dirty, slimy rat. My sister wouldn't wipe her feet on you. Well, maybe after I've told her the jam you're in, she might consider my proposition. That is, if she loves you, maybe she'd be worth more to me. You wouldn't dare approach her with any... I go on beat it, kid. I got other business tonight. I won't leave this room to you, promise that. I'll beat it. I say you're off well, something off your head. Go on. You put nothing off my head. This will stop you! Put down that gun, Rogers. You can't get away. And, and that's just the way it happened. Then, then you did shoot Doyleson, Rogers. I thought I did at the time, Blue Beetle. In the excitement, I imagined I pulled the trigger. But since then, as I think back, I know I didn't pull the trigger of that gun. Did you take the gun to Doyleson's place with you? No. I saw it lying on the table near where I was standing in Doyleson's apartment. But a bullet was fired from that gun. Moroni testified. Wait a minute. Moroni. Say, that gives me an idea. You think you can save me from... Oh, I don't want to die. I didn't shoot Doyleson. I didn't. Take it easy, Roger. Look, call the guard and ask him to get the warden here in a hurry. Tell him you want to make a statement. But what good will that... When the guard unlocks the cell door to let the warden in, I'll slip out. All right. All right, I'll do it. Oh, God! God! I want to see the warden! Oh, warden! Oh, warden! What has the Blue Beetle in mind? Who is Maroney? And what has he to do with this case? A little later, Dan Garrett is sitting in Dr. Franz's laboratory in the rear of the little apothecary shop. But Danny, what makes you think Moroni shot Doyle? I don't know. Just a hunch, I guess. But apparently only one shot was fired. According to Maroney's testimony at the trial, it came from the gun that Rogers held. That's Maroney's testimony. He had just as much of a motive as Rogers for warning Doyleson out of the way. You mean his rival lone racket? Precisely. Doyleson was muscling in on his territory, as I told you. And Maroney was there that night to threaten Doyleson, I'm sure of it. But Rogers admitted on the stand that he pointed the gun at Doyleson, fired it, and Doyleson dropped with a bullet through the heart. But did the bullet that killed Doyleson Come from the gun held by Rogers. 
Well, that I don't know. I'm going to call the ballistic department right now. Check with our expert, Pat Sullivan. Uh, go ahead, Danny. Uh, there's the phone right there. Thanks. And another thing. Rogers must have been an expert marksman to have shot Doylton through the heart. The distance was about 20 feet, wasn't it? According to testimony. Hello? Hello, police department. This is Patrolman Dan Garrett. Say, uh, give me ballistics. Hello, Sullivan? Garrett. Uh, do you remember the Roger Doylton case? Well, tell me something. Uh, was any examination made of the bullet extracted from Doylton's body to establish the fact that it was shot from the murder gun? Hmm. Is that so? Yes, yes, I understand. Uh, say, could you get hold of the gun and the bullet and check them? Oh, uh, thanks a lot. Goodbye. What did he have to say? The bullet was never checked against the gun. Well, that's strange. Yes, it is. But Sullivan's going to check them now, isn't he? Yes, and the Blue Beetle's going to check on Mr. Maroney. Anything special you'd like to take with you? Uh, yes, Doc. What about the midget portable television set you were working on? Well, it isn't ready yet. Oh, uh, well, how about the midget portable sound recording device? Oh, oh that's ready. I I'll get it for you. Thanks, Doc. I'll need it tonight. All right. Here. Here you are, Danny. Now, uh, just slip it under your Blue Beetle armor. Okay. And where will the Blue Beetle fly tonight? To call upon Mr. Maroney first, and then upon the governor of the state. anybody get through to the governor, are you? What? That's right. Keep everybody away from the governor. You know what'll happen to you if someone gets to him with a plea for a stay of execution? Well, see that you keep on the job. You're the governor's private secretary. Should be easy. Okay. But remember, if Rogers don't burn, it'll be just too bad for you. Goodbye. The Blue Beetle. Yes, the Blue Beetle. Well, what do you want, masquerader? The murderer of Bats Doylson. Oh, yeah? Well, you got the wrong address. You want the state penitentiary. You shot Doylson, Maroney. Yeah, how are you going to prove it? With the bullet that killed Doylson. And your gun there. Think so? Well, I'll just give you a taste of this gun like I gave Doylson. <laughs> Emptied your gun, Maroney, just as I thought you would. Why, you... Your bullets can't injure the Blue Beetle. Give me that gun. Come and take it, wise guy. That'll be easy. And I'll take your confession, just as I recorded it, on the device under my Blue Beetle armor. Oh. Back on your heels, murderer. Back on your oh. back. <clears throat> That'll keep you quiet for a while. I'll just tie you up and take this gun. The cops are already on their way over here. There's a hot waiting for you, Maroni. Uh, any other business, Jennings? No, oh, Your Excellency. It's nearly morning, sir. Why don't you get some rest? Uh, I think I will. You know, it's strange no one has approached me with a petition for clemency in this Rogers case. Well, Your Excellency, it uh, uh, was a case of deliberate murder. Yeah. Well, what's the sound? The Blue Beetle. Blue, Blue Beetle. Beetle. Yes, Your Excellency, and yes to you also, you gangster-controlled private secretary. I'll call the police, Your Excellency. This is an impudent... Hey, where you are, Jennings. I want you and the governor to hear something. But I have no time for things like this. I'm going to get some rest. Besides, this is highly irregular. Yes, but an innocent man's life is at stake. In 20 minutes, Stanley Rogers may be dead. Unless you sign a stay of execution, Your Excellency. But there's no reason, no new evidence. Here's new evidence, Your Excellency, right here. In this little black box. This portable recording device. Listen. get through to the governor, are you? What? That's right. Keep everybody away from the governor. You know what'll happen to you if someone gets to him with a plea for a stay of execution. What's this? 
Well, see that you keep on the job. You're the governor's private secretary. Oh, Jenny. Easy. Well, I, I, keep I, quiet, I, Jennings, and listen. Okay. But remember, if Rogers don't burn, it'll be just too bad for you. Goodbye. <laughs> The Blue Beetle. Yes, the Blue Beetle. Well, what do you want, masquerader? Murderer of Bat Stoylson. Oh, yeah? Well, you've got the wrong address. You want the state penitentiary. You shot Doylson, Maroney. Yeah? How are you going to prove it? With the bullet that killed Doylson and your gun there. You think so? Well, I'll just give you a taste of this gun like I gave Doylson. <laughs> down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Oh, no. 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 I don't want to die. Steady, son. Steady. Oh. All right, Father. I'm all right now. It was just the sight of that. Faster, pilot. Faster. An innocent man's life is at stake. Paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sit here, my son, adjust the straps. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I. Faster, driver, faster! An innocent man's life is at stake! I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff. Ten seconds. They comfort me. The Blue Beetle! Blue Beetle. Oh. Yes, the Blue Beetle, with a reprieve from the governor. What sort of a ghastly joke is this? This is no joke, Warden. The Blue Beetle comes as a messenger of justice. Here, take this paper. You'll find it's a bona fide stay of execution, signed by the governor of this state. But I don't understand. You're about to electrocute the wrong man, Warden. Stanley Rogers is innocent. The real murderer is on his way here, under police escort. I hope you'll have the guest chamber ready for him. Good night, gentlemen. The Blue Beetle's job is done. of time, the Blue Beetle saved an innocent man from death in the electric chair. Only ten seconds between death and life for a foolish lad who liked to gamble. Later in Dr. Fran's little apothecary shop, Patrolman Dan Garrett is discussing certain features of the case with Dr. Fran. What did Pat Sullivan, the ballistic expert, find when he checked the murder bullet? That the murder bullet was fired from a gun I took from Maroney. But that still doesn't account for the fact that the gun Rogers thought he fired at Doylson showed that a bullet had been fired from one chamber. Well, I hopped over to Doylson's apartment before I came here. As a bullet embedded in the woodwork behind the piano, I phoned the inspector and he's sending someone over to investigate and make photographs. Then you Maroney think... fired that bullet into the wall out of the gun Rogers dropped after he ran from the apartment. Mm, I see. Maroney must have shot Doylson with his gun from the door of the bedroom as Rogers was pointing his gun at Doylson. That's correct. And in the emotional stress of the moment, Rogers believed he himself actually fired the shot. Yes, Maroney realized that and framed Rogers. Oh, shameful, shameful. And to think that the governor's secretary was involved in this. Well, he was in fear of his life. He didn't dare cross up Maroney. Well, Danny, you've done a fine night's work. Uh, you'd better get some rest. Yes, Doc. I can use it. Well, so long. I'll see you later. Dan Garrett is going to put the Blue Beetle to bed.
And so the Blue Beetle has done another noble deed, saved a life and brought a murderer to justice. What will his next adventure be in his crusade against crime? That question will be answered in the next episode of The Blue Beetle. Copyrighted Fox feature appearing in Mystery Men Comics Magazine on sale at your newsstand. The Blue Beetle is on the air twice a week on this same station. Consult the broadcast schedule in your local newspapers. And don't forget to listen in. That's the end of our first episode. We'll get to the second part in five minutes. Until then, do whatever you want for the next five minutes. Unless it's illegal, then don't do it. Blue Beetle will find you.
This marks the end of the five minute break. Here comes part two. Woo! Such an elaborate system existed. Sure, there's a regular ring that controls the racket. 
when what about spiritualism and mediums? Are these so-called mediums part of this racket? Well, most of them. They constitute the most dangerous part of the racket. Well, how do you mean? Well, when they get hold of a client, some susceptible individual who believes it's possible to talk to the loved ones who've died, they work on that individual's mind, influence that individual to commit acts he or she would never think of committing if left alone. What's the connection between fortune tellers and media? The fortune tellers take out easy marks. And if considered worthwhile material to work on, they're inveigled into visiting a spiritualist or urged to sit in on a seance. My, my, my. People are so gullible. Yes, they are. They have to be protected from themselves. Uh, somebody's in the store. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. Probably Mike Manigan. If it is, send him back. Yeah, hello, Doc. Is Danny the third of his food? The door in the street? <laughs> yes. Danny's back in the laboratory. He's probably <laughs> cooking up a witch's brew of some sort. Uh, you mind if I go in? Oh, no. Go right back, Officer Manigan. Hello, Mike. Uh, hello, Danny. <laughs> Are you ready to visit the medium? Ready and waiting. Hey, you look very smart in your civvies. Yeah, they, they think your advice is good. They, they never suspect we're cops in these clothes. I don't know about that. My windblown barb and your red face. You don't look like bookkeepers. Or where are you two boys going? To uh, a, a seance. You mean seance, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to talk with the dead. Uh, who's the medium? Well, he calls himself Professor Wingert. Uh, where's the seance being held? Wingert's house out on Elm Street. You know that old place that sits back from the street? Yes, yes, I know it. Uh, people used to say it was haunted. That's the place. Well, uh, come on, Patrolman Garrett. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Garrett. Uh, you go ahead, Mike. I want to ask Doc something. I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, I, I'll wait out front for you. Say, Doc, can I borrow your X-ray camera with a special infrared lens? Oh, certainly, Danny. I'll get it for you. Now, what, what can I carry it in? Oh, here. It's quite flat. Here, here. Uh, put it in this briefcase. Oh, thanks, Doc. I'll see you later. If the spirits don't get me. In another part of the city, an interesting discussion is being held. Banker James Henley is talking with his son, John, and his nephew, William. I want you, John, and you, William, to accompany me to the seance, Professor Windriff. May you be able to communicate with my my dead son, Rodney. Oh, Dad, it's all a fake. This spiritualism and medium and such stuff. I don't believe Professor Windriff or anybody else can communicate with the dead. Well, I do. You only have to take one look at the Professor to know that he's unusual. He has a faraway expression that psychic people have. Oh, nonsense. Uh, William is right, John. Professor Windrip is gifted beyond most mortals. I'm sure he will be able to communicate with my elder son who was killed in Spain. Uh, perhaps Rodney will be able to advise me in my financial affairs. He was always so right about things. I'm getting old, and I need his advice. Yes, and I'm sure his advice will still be good, Uncle James. Yes, William. I'm glad you have the right attitude toward these things. Well, let's get started to the seance. The sooner we get there, the sooner it will be over. Who's going to be out at Windrift's place, Daddy? Not sure. Charlie Storm and his son told me that Banker Henley's a frequenter of Windrift's seances. Well, how, uh, how are we going to get in there? Charlie got me two cards from a girlfriend of his, who's a hostess in one of those gypsy tea rooms. Do you think they'll suspect us? I don't know, but let me do the talking. You just keep still and look psychic. And how does a guy look when he looks psychic? Just stare straight at everything and everybody. Just as if you were looking through them at the immortal spheres. That's the way I look when I've been hit on the head. Well, uh, I'll talk you one before we go in, if that'll help. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> I can look psychic without your help. <laughs> okay. That's the house ahead. Yeah, it's a pleasant-looking spot for a murder. Are you healed? No, I didn't bring a gun. Well, I did. And if any goes to depart a spirit, that's gay with me. I'm going to use it. Now, here we are. Come on, Mike, and remember to look psychic. Okay, Daddy. Good evening. All you expected? Uh, we have cards. Very good. Will you come in, please? The seance is about to begin. Thank you. Uh, who are these gentlemen, Gertie? They have cards, sir. Are you Professor Windrup? Yes, I am. 
this is Mr. Michael P. Manigan, and I'm Mr. Van Norden Garrett. We were recommended to you by the Gypsy Tea Room. My friend here is psychic. Oh, I see. Well, uh, come in, gentlemen. They're right in here. Uh, this is Mr. James Henley, the banker. His son, John, and his nephew, William. Mr. Manigan uh, and Mr. Sheriff. Please Mr. Please now, will you all take seats, please? You and Mr. Manigan sit here, Mr. Garrett. Thank you. We sit in a circle and hold hands. Uh, Mr. Henley, you sit here on my left, between Mr. Garrett and me. John, you sit on my right. And William, you sit next to your cousin John, between him and Mr. Manigan. Right. Here we go. This is a lot of poppycock. Uh, John, John, be quiet. If you don't want to sit in, leave the room. Oh, all right, Father. I'll keep quiet. I'm afraid your son is not in a receptive mood, Mr. Henley. No, oh, he'll be all right, Professor. He's young, that's all. Yes. Now, we'll each take the hand of the persons on either side of us. And I'll put the lights out with this switch in the floor at my feet. Quiet, everybody. Relax. Banish thoughts of this mundane world. And let your minds wander out into the infinite. What was that sound? My teeth chattering. Father! Father! Is that you, Rodney, my son? Yes, Father. Your son who was killed in space. Speak to me. Speak to me. Rodney, are you well? I cannot rest. A heavy burden lies on my soul. What is the burden on your soul, Rodney? My brother John does not love you. Only William loves you. Back the line. William is a crook. This seance is... <sighs> Lights. Switch on those lights. What happened here? John. John. What's wrong? We're lying to you. What, what happened? What happened here? Oh, look. Look, my son, John, there on the floor. Stand back, everybody. Manigan, cover those exits. He's dead, all right. Stabbed in the back. Wait a minute. What is this? Who are you to give orders in my house? Coleman Van Garrett. My psychic friend is Officer Manigan. Oh, and if anybody attempts to leave this room, this gun of mine will speak. And it won't be a psychic message either. Go ahead, brother Danny. This is a case of murder. An hour later, back at the little apothecary shop of Dr. Franz, Dan Garrett and Dr. Franz are examining two photographs which have just been developed. Now, Doc, this is the first one I snapped to the X-ray camera. It shows the interior of the room where the seance was held. Uh, uh, what, uh, what's that dark spot there on the wall? Uh, uh, hmm. It looks like a like a loudspeaker behind a large painting. Uh, that's probably where the voice came from that old man Henley thought was the voice of his dead son, Rodney. Yeah, he was the old man's favorite son. He volunteered to fight in Spain and was killed in battle. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's see the other photograph. Yeah, right. I took this one just as John said. This is a lie. Shows the group seated in a circle. Look at... Uh, look there. It's a murderer. His hand is clutching a dagger raised to strike. It even shows the cotton he wrapped around the hilt to avoid leaving fingerprints. This photograph alone will convict the murderer of John Henley. Are you going to phone police headquarters to hold no. him? If they hold him, we may not be able to run the higher-ups in the racket there. Oh, then you think the murderer of John Henley was not the top man? Oh, no. He was just part of the ring. Brains of the racket are higher up, but they should have realized that John Henry's death would bring down the police on their necks. Somebody made a miscue there. I don't think the ring planned John's death. What do you think their plan was? Simply to use the dead son Rodney's fake voice to work on the old man and influence him to let his nephew William advise him. And in time, persuade him to make William his heir. But why? William is probably being used by this gang of racketeers. The old man should die leaving his vast fortune to William, and William would be blackmailed into coming across with a large sum of money to the racketeers. Mm, what devilish thing evil minds can think of. Yes. Oh, by the way, Doc, put those negatives in a safe place. Uh, they'll be safe with me, Danny. All right. Well, the Blue Beetle is going into action on this gang of crooked buzzards. Well, what are you going to do? 
Blue Beetle is paying several visits tonight. Before another day dawns, the spiritualist racket will be smashed. Who is the murderer of John Henley? What will the Blue Beetle discover at Professor Windrup's residence? Whose warped mind is behind all these fiendish schemes to prey upon honest but superstitious and ignorant persons? Off through the night, feeds the Blue Beetle in his crusade against crime. Another part of the city, a man is issuing orders to his subordinates. A dark, sinister-looking man whose tight-lipped smile has no mirth in it. His business is creating spirits. Spirits of those who have departed. Joe, that last batch of cloth you bought me was certainly cheap. My old nature makes better ectoplasm than that junk. Yeah, but you see, boy. Never mind the alibi. Trade it in and get something thinner. Park. Yes, sir. You still recording famous voices off the air? Yes, sir. Okay. Be my secretary and get a list of the 400 best families. Yes, sir. Call them one at a time. See if you can sell them the idea of having each voice in the family recorded as a memento for their relatives after they pass on. Make copies of each. We can use them in our seance. I'll do it right away, sir. Go ahead. And as you go out, tell Sweeney and maintenance to order two dozen more loudspeaker sets through my radio stores. Fifty dozen crystal balls and 75 cases of playing cards. Right away, sir. Did you send for me, Chief? Yes. Now, uh, look, my apple cheek little trigger man. Professor Windrip phoned me that he has reason to suspect that some photographs were taken at his seance tonight by Patrolman Dan Garrett. The negatives may still be in his possession. Or they may be in the possession of Dr. Franz that runs that little apothecary shop. I want those photographs. Okay, Chief, I'll get them. If you meet with resistance, let your conscience be your guide. I got you, Chief. My trigger finger's awful nervous tonight. It must be the weather. The professor calling LG. Show him in. Oh, hello, LG. This is certainly a terrible state of affairs. When did the cops release you? Just now. Someone bailed us all out and I came right to you. I'll bet you left a trail a mile wide. No. I changed trains three times in the subway. Walked through Ralph's department store and then took a taxi here. Good. Well, what do you advise me to do? My business is ruined. Your business? <laughs> you should have thought of that before you killed John Henley. I killed him? You mean William? I mean you. William wouldn't have the nerve. But William hated his cousin. He was sitting right next to him. And so were you. What makes you think so? A little bird told me. I got five down at police headquarters. They heard the questioning of your people by the police. Oh, yes. Oh. They said you were playing up to old man Henley. Well, I... Oh, say. You aren't figuring on trying to double-cross me on this, are you? Why, no, LG, I assure you. You'd better not if you know what's good for you. Now, what about those two policemen, Mannigan and Garrett? They'll be taken care of. When the case comes up for trial, they won't be there to testify. Yes, but the photographs... I'm sure I heard the click of a camera during the seance. The room was dark, wasn't it? Pitch black. Okay. But you don't have to worry. I'll leave everything to me. Now, what do you think I'd better do now? Go out to your place and play dumb. I'll be out there later, as soon as I've had a talk with William Henley. He'll probably spend a few days on his uncle's yacht. In the meantime, I've got my men guarding everybody concerned. I imagine the Blue Beetle will stick his nose into this. And if he does... It'll be just too bad for Mr. Blue Beetle. Now look, Henley. 
I don't think you killed your cousin John. I didn't. I swear I didn't. Well, okay. Now, you just take it easy. Lay up here, Uncle, and you'll be the white-haired boy. He always believed anything his son Rodney told him. But this murder, what about that? We're going to let Professor Windriff take the rap. He's all washed up with us. I see. Later, you will introduce your uncle to another medium. We'll go to work on him again. In your favor. You'll be his heir. Yes, but he may live a long time and I need money now. My creditors are hounding me and I can't wait. Now, take it. Take it easy. Just as soon as he makes a will in your favor... He'll meet with an accident. You mean... He'll be talking with his dead son, Rodney, direct. Very clever scheme, but it won't work. The Blue Beetle. Get the Blue Beetle, and he's going to nip. Can I let him have it, LG? Kill it! Go ahead, shoot. Your bullets can't injure the Blue Beetle. But this belaying pin will. Good work, Gus, good work. You throw a mean belaying pin. Sounds like a light. What'll I do with him? Tie him up. Weight his body with an anchor and toss him overboard. Okay, LG. Well, Mr. Blue Beetle, you're gone for a night swim. <sighs> and you ain't coming back. Say, hey, aren't you a, a bit ruthless, LG? In my racket, you have to be. Now, you be a good boy and we'll all be rich. Well, what are you going to do now? I'm going ashore. Professor Windrip is going to have a caller and get a big surprise. <laughs> I'm going to get some sleep. This has been a very trying evening. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Did you dismantle and hide the phonograph equipment and records? Yes, sir. Everything's been taken care of. Uh, Will you be sleeping late in the morning, sir? Yes, Gherkin. Uh, Call me about noon. Uh, Very good, sir. Good heavens. Who can that be at this time of night? uh, I'll see, sir. It may be Mr. L.G., as you call him. Good evening, sir. The master's just retiring. Well, he'll see me. Oh. Oh, there you are. Oh, yes. Uh, What have you found out, LG? The Blue Beetle paid a visit to Henley's yacht while I was talking with William Henley. Well, how did you get rid of him? He's bathing in the sound with a 50-pound anchor tied to his feet. Great heaven. Yes, he was in the way. Just as you're in my way, Professor Windrup. What what, what do you mean? You're all so, Professor. You almost cleared our racket. I can't wait for the law to take its course. Besides, you might spill the beans. Oh, no. I'm taking no chances. I'm going to close your mouth right... Drop that gun, LG, or I'll flash you with my magic ray. The Blue Beetle. Yes, the Blue Beetle. You must be a strong swimmer, Blue Beetle. I am. I learned a few tricks from Houdini. Otherwise, I'd be lying at the bottom of the sound. Get him, Gherkin. Get him from behind. Oh, no, you don't. Not this time, Gherkin. The Blue Beetle's on the alert. And here's one for you, Professor Windrip. Murderers. Now I'll take that gun, LG. Certainly, Blue Beetle. Here it is, right under it. <laughs> Just a little jujitsu. Now I've got the gun. What are you going to do? You've got nothing on me. Oh, no? I swam back to the yacht after I freed myself from the anchor rope and had a little talk with William. Was he surprised to see me? He is going to talk and talk plenty. He can't prove who killed John Henley. But the photographs Dan Garrett took at the seance can. What do you know about those photographs? The Blue Beetle knows everything. Now listen, Blue Beetle. Those photographs will never be shown at any trial. Pudgy has seen to that. What do you mean? Pudgy's my trigger man. I sent him to interview Dan Garrett's friend, Dr. Franz, the chemist. If the photographs are there, he'll get them or else. Open the door and I break it in. Well, Mr. L.G., the law's caught up with you. Your racket smashed and you'll burn along with Professor Wind. Not yet, I won't. I'll keep the tear with this point. No, you don't. The law's going to send you and the murderous Professor Windrup where you can't cause any more harm. All right, now, all right. Reach for the tears. Well, if it ain't the Blue Beetle, Professor Windrup and the Limey Servant, what a haul. And who's this? That's LG, the ringleader of the gang. Just tried to take poison and I hit him. Here, Manigan, catch this gun. What? Well, okay, Blue Beetle. Sorry to leave so suddenly. Hey, wait a minute, Blue Beetle. You're under arrest. Hey. Hanged if the Blue Beetle didn't dive out of the window. Well, boys, slip the handcuffs on these babies and we'll take them along. 
I'll catch the blue beetle the next time. And so the blue beetle caught and turned over to the police several racketeers. But what about Doc Franz and the photograph? What has happened to them? Has Pudgy carried out the orders of his chief, the infamous LG? Let's hurry back to the little apothecary shop of Dr. Franz. Doc! Doc Franz, where are you? Hello, Danny. Well, what's your hurry? Are you all right? Never felt better in my life. But, but, the gunman. Did, did Pudgy... Uh, rosy cheek, a rather confident gentleman, called earlier tonight. Uh, I was in my laboratory at the time. Yeah, well... Well, what happened? He mentioned something about some photographs. He was rather insistent that I give them to him. Well, did he... Uh, did yes, he... yes. Uh, he pointed a gun at me. What did you do? Squirted a syringe full of concentrated ammonia in his eyes. Good. Where is he now? I tied him up to keep him from playing with my chemicals in there. Oh, that's great. And the photographs, you say? Everything's under control. Ah, fine. Those photographs will convict Professor Windrup of young Henley's murder... And William's testimony will take care of LG. Uh, what does LG stand for, Danny? According to William, LG stands for live ghost. The man behind the spirit. Well, if you'll excuse me, Doc, I'm going to turn in. The Blue Beetles had a very busy night. <laughs> together. And another racket smashed, thanks to Dan Garrett, Mike Manigan, Dr. Franz, and the Blue Beetle. What new adventure awaits the Blue Beetle? This question will be answered in the next episode of the Blue Beetle. And now... Here's the Blue Beetle himself to say a few words. The moral of this story is that there's no honor among thieves. In other words, never become associated with anyone in any endeavor or plan that is not absolutely straightforward. If you do, you can expect to be double-crossed or become the cat's paw or the fall guy. Remember to always look up never down, and to associate only with those persons you can respect. The Blue Beetle is a copyrighted box feature appearing in Mystery Men Comics magazine and the Blue Beetle magazine. The Blue Beetle is on the air twice a week on this same station. Consult the broadcast schedule in your local newspapers. Don't forget to listen in to The Blue Beetle. <laughs> <laughs>